Saul, and we'll visit that, and then we'll go to our text or our foundational reading, expositional reading in Romans 3, 1 through 31. Let me give you a little bit of background first. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we're talking about what happened with Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10. When you get there, say Amen. Word of God says in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel that something happened to Saul. And it, to me it's a type and shadow of being born again. The Word of God, you see, the, the anointing came upon Saul because it was prophesied unto him. The Word of God says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, it says, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And this is a prophecy that Samuel spoke on Saul before he was anointed. I want you to listen 
and the limit way off. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and you shall prophesy with them, and shall be turned into what? Another man. Now that's impossible, right? How many of you have ever tried to do better or make yourself better than you were? Uh, because you found out, you know, you know there's a lot of things in you that are less than perfect, right? So we try to make ourselves better, whether it be physically, mentally, prayer life, whatever. But I've always found that when we try on our own, we fall flat on our face. Every last one of us. Now Saul, in this particular case, he was anointed to be the king, right? And it goes a little bit further than that because this in typology is that he was changed into another man. Not just because he became a king, but listen to what it says. And shall be turned into another man. It's a type of shadow being born again. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion what? Serve thee. For God is with thee, right? So when these things came upon Saul, what was the main reason for that to happen? So he could serve God, right? So he could serve God. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings. Now remember what happened a little bit later on. Saul decided not to wait for Samuel. And he took it upon himself. He stepped outside of his anointing and he did the burnt offerings. And he did all this stuff. Because Samuel was a little bit later than he expected him to be. What, what was the problem with that? Why couldn't he be able to do that? Because he wasn't anointed to do that. He was anointed to do what he was called to do and not outside of that. Yes, he was out of order. And to sacrifice, sacrifice is a peace offering. Seven days shall thy tarry till, now look, this is where he, after seven days, you know, he just said, hey, listen, he's not coming or he's late. But listen to what Samuel said. Seven days shall thou tarry till I come to thee. So seven days is the minimum. What he was saying was till I come, don't do anything no matter what. But seven days is the minimum, right? right? And this is where he decided that seven days was the limit. But that's not what Samuel said. He said, seven days shall tarry till I come to thee and show thee what you're supposed to do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. Now, this is why I say it's a type of shadow. It's not just... Uh, Parable or parallel, it's, it is a typology because he says he gave him another heart. As the word of God says with us, he says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit so that you can walk and follow me. He said, God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring this as your first reading, Saul was anointed. In other words, he was in covenant with God to do a specific thing. Now, we know that in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see where Paul is talking to those believers, and he was telling them, he said, listen, remember 1 and 2. First of all, he addressed all mankind. He didn't just address the, the church in Rome. He addressed all mankind in chapter 1. He said, he told everyone that was there, he said, we're all from a fallen nature. We all have done horrible things. We all are perverted. We all, all the way through, right? In chapter 1, primarily, that's what he said in Romans. He laid out the foundation that there's nobody. We all come from a fallen nature. That's what chapter 1 was all about. But then he, Paul brought it a step further, just like in a conversation I would have with you or you would have with anyone else. You don't leave a conversation there. You continue with it to bring a point about. Paul, first of all, talked about all mankind being in a fallen state. Everybody. And he said the only hope for that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it be Gentile or Jew. 
He made that point. We're all in that fallen nature because even though God's people were chosen, the Jew was God's chosen people, they too had a covenant, but that covenant had to lead to salvation. And that salvation couldn't be found in the works of the law or the ceremonial law or all the typologies that God had brought before them to teach them. They had come to a point to where they started thinking that the covenant itself was God. And as long as the covenant was intact, as long as they did the outward things that they had no need or desire or that they needed to walk in the way that God had called them to walk as a separate people. So he goes on to chapter 2, Romans, we talked about it last week, where the, and I wanted you to hear this, and I'm going to bring it to a point real quick here. When he left the general declaration of all men, the only, only hope that we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he was saying. That's the only hope. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto all men for their salvation, right? So then what did he do? Did he just stop there? No, he continued and he laid out all the pervertedness, all the sinfulness of mankind, all the sins that we are involved in, have been involved in. Unfortunately, some of us may still be in that area. And I'm not talking to you in particular. I'm talking to the church as a whole. And the thing is this, he didn't stop there either because the the religious folks, the, the moral folks, are those who have the word of God. And I want you to see a picture here. I want you to see the, the imagery that I'm trying to lay out. I believe that Paul was laying out. In chapter 2 of Romans, he, took, he turned and talked to the Jews. He said, now wait a minute, because the Jews were, were, were agreeing with him. Yeah, man, they deserve judgment. Yeah, they know. And he said, because, you know, they don't have, they don't have a covenant with God. And Paul turned right around to chapter 2 of Romans and he said, you're inexcusable. He says, in other words, he said, you have the word of God before you and yet you do the same thing. Do you think that God's going to excuse you while judging them? And he said, Pastor, uh, what does that have to do with me? It has everything to do with us because we too are covenant people of God. So when he was speaking to them, he also speaks to us. We say, Lord God, hey, I'm born again. I'm saved by grace through faith. I got the word of God. I got a, I got a nice church. I got a nice church family. I, I know all the ins and outs. And God says, you think that those who do that are going to be judged? And when you do that, you're going to be excused because you say, I'm saved by grace through faith. You think that your covenant is any greater than theirs when your covenant does not do what it's intended to do. And what does that make you a new man? Because you see in Galatians chapter 6, 14 and 15, that's exactly what Paul says. He says this, he says, whether circumcision or uncircumcision, he said, neither one availeth much. But what does make a difference is when you become a new creation, a new creature in Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17 says. And go there for me real quick. We all like to read the last four, but there's something else that goes before that I always like to bring you to. It says here in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse 15. It says, And what, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Are you with me? Verse 15. Are you with me? Amen. But unto him which died for them, and then it put this in there too, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet not henceforth know we him no more. See, we all look to the last verse, and that's the verse that we hang on. But what I've just done is presented to you, started with Saul, and bringing you to Galatians, and then now bringing you to 2 Corinthians, is showing you that the covenant promises whether they be in the Old Testament 
or whether they be in the New Testament, unless they accomplish what they're intended to accomplish, they have no value. And that's what Paul was saying. When we rely on that without allowing that that we rely on to do what it's intended to do, then what good is our covenant promises? You see, the Old Testament and the covenant promises, and I want you to hear this before I get into it, the covenant promises in the Old Testament were the Mosaic Law, we know that the law in itself, but they were designed, as Galatians says, to teach us to be a school teacher, tell us about what Jesus was coming to do. That's what the Old Testament saints were supposed to understand. They had the Torah, they had the oracles of God. God entrusted them with the oracles of God to teach the world. But they didn't. And they didn't do what they were intended to do. So therefore they fell short. But God's still faithful. And he's still faithful with us. And this is what Paul was talking about. And this is why it's so important to lay out Romans. The, I can tell you, Romans is the hub to understanding all the other uh, epistles especially the depth of salvation. You notice that in Romans, when we talk about this right here, I notice, Brother Jonathan, that he's going to be arguing almost the same argument, Brother Roger, that he argued in Romans 6, when they said, well, listen, if, if, great, if, if uh, God's grace abounds, then we need to sin more so that grace can abound more. And that's ludicrous, right? But that's what they said. That's what they were thinking. And they were thinking the same thing in our reading today. And Paul jumps right down again. He brings them right back to what he was talking about. In chapter 1 and in chapter 2, now he, load, he unloads the truth for them to understand point blank. Whether you be Jew or Gentile, either way, no matter the covenant that you have, that covenant in itself, unless it's active, unless it has had its way with you, is of no value. If it hasn't changed you in the Old Testament, if it, if it hadn't pointed you to that place of faith in, in the coming Messiah and understanding the, the actual laws, why they were given, then you end up like Saul. Does anybody see the, the word picture that I'm, I want to lay out to you right now? Now, if you will, go with me to Romans. Everything that I just said, now I want to share this with you. I kind of gave you an overview on chapter 1 and chapter 2. Remember, the key point is in chapter 1 was that Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. And he makes sure to say this to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God. Now I want you to hear that before I move on. He said this, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Listen, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Who is the righteousness of God? Jesus Christ. So you see, it's the righteousness of God that is revealed to us. And how is that revealed to us? When we see all that he's going to talk about, the wretchedness of man, the fallen man, our sinfulness, all that we've done, all that man has done from the beginning of time, there's no way, it's impossible for man to save himself. It's impossible for you and I to get on a scale and say, I've done better things than I've done worse things, and use that as a way of salvation. And that's what the, the Jew was thinking. And that's what, unfortunately, too many of the evangelical world today is saying, well, you know, I'm saved by grace through faith. Therefore, I can sin like I want so grace can abound. That's the same mentality as what I'm trying to get you to think. So the message is relative to the church today, just like it was then. He goes on to say in chapter 2, as I said, well, just before you get there, in verse uh, 31 of chapter 1, it says, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And then it goes right on. Remember, I want you, when I'm talking and teaching like this, I want you to remove the chapter numbers and just understand the flow of the conversation. 
transliteration there, right? It says, then he goes on to say, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein you judges another. Remember, we talked about that Sunday. Those who judges another, thou condemnest your own self, for thou judges doest the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Now, he lays the plant the field out level. And then he goes here in chapter 1, excuse me, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. And look what he says. After all this, let me go back and read the last verse and come into that. He says here in verse 28 and 29, he goes on to say, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision. Remember what I said about Galatians 6, 14 and 15. Paul said the same thing, reestablishing that same truth. Also, you see the, the byproduct of genuine salvation is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. With the prelude of verse 5, 15. You live unto him, not unto yourself. It goes here to say this. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Remember Saul was given what? A new heart. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now, let's go into verse 1 of chapter 3 of Romans. What advantage then had the Jew? And this is the question that the listeners were asking Paul. Well, if we have all this, if we are the Jew, if we have the covenant promises, then what advantage do we really have? And you can ask yourself, and also in Psalms, it speaks about the same thing. It's just a word. What advantage do we have as genuine blood-bought children of God? And this is what the Jew is saying. What advantage do we have because we're Jew, we're God's chosen people? What advantage do we have? If, every, if we're going to be judged the same way, this is what they were saying. If we're going to be judged by what we do also, what advantage do we have having a covenant promise? And that's why a lot of people today want to tell you that God will not judge the believer even though he sinned. And you can sin and live like you want to. God will not judge that. But God will judge that because he's a righteous God. And because his righteousness is not something we do, but it's something that was done. His righteousness was revealed where? In Jesus Christ. That's why the impossible became possible. Even with the Jew, the covenant promises that they had, that didn't usher in salvation. It pointed them to salvation. Today, when people tell you, just come up to the altar and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you're going to be saved. There's more to it than that, isn't there? You need to understand that there's more to it. You can confess Santa Claus as your Savior too, but that don't save you. When he says confess, it actually means when you confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord. He's not somebody to sit on the side of you. He's over you. He's Lord. You can't know him as brother until you bow before him as Lord. And you can't follow him until you know him as God. The word of God goes on, and I want to read the whole thing. And then we'll go back and touch on it. The main verses, I think, I didn't put it up there. But the main, main verses I want you to, to really zero in tonight. And if I have to, we'll pick up on it following Wednesday. But it's 1 through 12, okay? Then I'm going to read the whole chapter. It says, what advantage then had the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? He's talking again. They were asking him again about what? The covenant promises. What advantages do we have? And this is what Paul said. He said, much in every way. He said, wait a minute. You have all the advantages compared to that of the world. Are you all with me? Chiefly, because that unto you or unto them were committed the oracles of God. What advantage? He said, the thing is, God chose you to give his word to. 
He gave his word to you, to the Jewish world, to the Jewish nation, to bring about God's will. And we know what happened. They didn't share it. They didn't bring it to the world around them. They made it their God instead of instructions. You see, sometimes we do the same thing, Brother Roger. We take instructions and make it our God. Instead of being God, our God, and letting Him enable us to follow His instructions. And see, we can't follow His instructions. You can't obey God, I can't obey God without the Holy Spirit taking full control of our life and something else. You can't say that you love God unless you keep His commandments. And to be honest with you, that's impossible for you to do in your own strength. Even if you would do it with your right hand, your left hand, and both your feet. Even if your mouth would say, yes, 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 Lord. You still have to deal with your thoughts. In between the yes, yes, Lord. And in between the steps of your feet. So it's impossible. But the impossible became possible. And that's what, I, what Paul is saying. He said, much in every way chiefly because that unto them were committed to oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? And he's saying, even if some do not believe that God's word is God's word and it is all that it says it is. He said, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? No, it will not. In other words, he said, the faith of God. Will they negate God's word? Will they remove what God said would happen? No, listen. God, when God said, you know, some people want to think, hey, listen, I can live like I want, uh, and God still blesses me. Or they say this, you know, I'm not born again like you guys, I don't do that, but I'm still blessed. Look, I got all this money, I got all this stuff, I got all this stuff. See, God's a good God. If you put your hand to something, he's going to bless your hand. What I mean by blessing is you sow a seed, it's going to come back to you. But the thing is this, that sooner or later, if you're not living for God, at the very end of your life, you will be judged for not living for God. Amen. But I'm saying, I'm talking about something that you need to understand. God's word does not return void. He says this, God forbid... Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. You know, when you read this, where was Paul getting all these words from? Anybody can tell me? Where was he talking? Where was he drawing this inspiration from? The Holy Spirit. Do you think the Holy Spirit was not also drawing from the Father? What the Father spoke from the beginning of time, what the Father spoke in Deuteronomy to the people of God, what the Father spoke to uh, Moses when he was leading, all and everything that Paul, listen to me, everything that Paul is drawing from comes from where? From the oracles of God, from the Torah, from the law and the writings of the prophets. Everything that he was pulling from comes from them, comes from there. He says this, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. You remember that somewhere? Where Satan tried to tempt Jesus Christ? And Jesus said, listen, I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm the Savior. I came to crush your head. Is that what Jesus told him when he was being tempted? You know what he simply said? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Brothers and sisters, is that possible for you and I in our own strength? Is it? Sister Sabrina, can you do that? Can I do that? No. But the key is, do you want to do that? Because if you want to do that, He enables you to do that. And see, it's the, it no longer is the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law. Word of God says here, that thou mightest be justified. And again, what he's talking about in chapter 3 is justification. Your past sins are forgiven because of the blood of Christ. And he's going to make that known. He says, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Wait a minute, I'm not going to be, he says, when thou art judged. Who is he speaking here? He's speaking to whoever's listening to him. Is he speaking to us today? Yes. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, 
What shall we say? Is it God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid for them. How shall God judge the world? In other words, if God is like us and he is unrighteous like us, then how is he able to judge the world in righteousness? It's impossible. They have to have someone that is greater than us. And who is greater than us? Jesus. So who has been given judgment to? Jesus. By whom? The Father. He's the only one who said, I haven't come to what? To abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Then he goes on to say, if, you're, if your righteousness does not surpass that of the scribes, you will no way enter into the kingdom of God. Right? In Matthew, he says this, for if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie under his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? He said, why am I still judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Does that not sound like what was said in Romans 6.1? When he said, let us sin more so that grace can abound more. And what did Paul say? Well, you know, we need to think about that. Is that what he said? No, he said, God forbid. God forbid. He said that good may come whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? And you know, he says this. No, in no wise, in no way, for we have before proved both Gentiles, excuse me, Jews and Gentiles. Again, he goes right back to chapter 2 of Romans. He goes right back to chapter 1, where he says, whether you be a Jew or a Gentile, we're all fallen in nature. The only difference is God chose the Jew through the promise made to Abraham to present the oracles of God, to hold the truth of God, and to bring it into the world. He goes on to say this. No, in no wise or way, for we have before proved, when he says before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that we're all under, or all under sin. Again, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Who is he talking to? He's talking to all, everyone. And our own self, whether it be the Gentile, whether it be the Jew, and what he's saying, in your own self, in your own nature, you would not have sought God. You wouldn't, I wouldn't. It's only when I came to the end of myself that I did. And that most of us it are like that. No matter what you say, you could not do it on your own. That's why he says, there's none that seek him. We saw him because he enabled us to seek him. When Nell and I were going through a lot of things, when we first started walking with the Lord, and there was a lot of um, problems here and there, we um, God removed us from the church that we were at, and he wanted to send us on a journey because there was a lot of things going on that was not right. And uh, God wanted to separate us, and he brought us to different churches so we could see what was going on. So that we'd be in a place when he wanted to clean up the pulpit, when he ordained me to be a pastor of this church, that I would not only have the word and his vision in my heart, but also have the knowledge of what I've seen in the other churches and what I wanted to make sure would not replicate itself here. And that's why it was easier for me to stay behind a chair than to, and to have a tent ministry where I could hide if I needed to than to be put in the public. But what I want to say is this, that I realize that the only way things happen is when we surrender to the true work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And it depends on what you really want. Most people want God and the work of God in their lives to get things. Now you might be young and say, well, that, we all need that. No, God already knows what you need. That's why he says, seek ye the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. You see, he doesn't say seek the kingdom of God first and leave it like that. 
he says, and his righteousness. So when you look at this, he says here, there's none that understand. He says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seek it after God. When we went to these other churches, well, the point I wanted to make is, Nell and I became very disappointed and disillusioned in a lot of areas concerning certain things we saw because they were not of the Holy Spirit. They were very man-made and they were organized religion. They'd become organized religion. And that's what I want you to understand. Organized religion in itself organizes everything so much so that the Holy Spirit has no place. And that's what I saw happening in many churches and many believers. And I made it a compact or a covenant with the Lord that it would never happen here. And I can't do that on my own. It takes the Holy Spirit and it takes each one of you to join with me to make sure that we don't get to a point where we're so brittle and so dry and so orchestrated and so unteachable that we don't want to hear the word of God because what I'm reading to you right now, I am not an expositional preacher, yet I can and I will as the Lord leads me. However he wants to preach the word of God, expositionally wise, it's important right now because he gave you some instructions to bring this word to you and let the Holy Spirit break it down. You already know it, but you don't know it line by line and paragraph for paragraph, paragraph. You don't see the, the relationship between 2 Corinthians 5, 15 and 17. You don't see the relationship yet of Romans 6, 1 through 6. You don't see the relationship yet between Galatians 6, 14 and 15. You don't see the relationship yet between 2 Samuel chapter 10, but you will. Because that's where we are. It says, they are all going out of the way. What way is that? The righteous women. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Wait a minute, Pastor. I've done some good things. I've done some good things. I, I mean, I do this, I do that. I feed the poor. I, I pray this, I pray that. I smile here. I come to church. I do that. You know, I do that. Do that. And God says, There ain't none of you that does anything good. And compare it to Him. Now, I'm talking about me on down. And that's my greatest prayer. You can ask my wife, Lord, let me make a difference in someone's life for your glory. It doesn't do me any good for an boy on my back. I want someone's life to be transformed for the glory of God and to impact people around them. And then he gets really, really down to the descriptive phrases here. He says, first of all, let's go back to verse 12. They are all going out the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You can put there in a parenthesis right there. That's where I wanted the emphasis to be at. But I'm going to read the rest of it so that we can come back to it. He says, this is what our good things or good works that we do, apart from him, look like to him. Their throat is an open scepter. You know what a scepter is? A tomb. So he said, when I look inside you, what I see down your throat, it leads me to nothing but bones, dead men. That's the works that we do. There's none. He said, with their tongues they have used deceit. Has anybody ever lied in here? Yes. We have. It's not something we're proud of, but yes, we have. And that's why he says, you haven't done any good. He said, the poison of an asp is under their lips. Oh, Pastor, this is, this is hard. I don't like, this is not me. This is line for line. And I don't have to explain it, do I? Is, is this to beat us up? No. Paul was saying, listen, they were asking, well, what good does it do to have covenant with God? What good does it do? So today you might say, what good does it do for me to follow the Lord? And I'm telling you that it is profitable for you when your heart is right and the Spirit of the Lord is truly directing your steps. You don't have to worry about whether or not you can do good enough or be good enough because Christ is good enough and He is your righteousness. You're not His righteousness. 
He is your righteousness because he is the righteousness of God imputed unto us. And that's what Abraham said in Romans chapter 4. It says that his, that the, the Lord's righteousness was imputed unto Abraham and not only to him, but us too. The seed. You can't earn it. I can't earn it. That's what justification about. But that's not what sanctification. I'm not talking about sanctification. I'm talking about justification. Your past sin, my past sin, as sister sings about, the stain of our sin was removed. I love that. Because it wasn't just covered. The stain of my sins were removed. It means and underneath the covenant that God made out of just for justification for me because of the righteousness of God in me, because of Jesus being in me, that the stain of my sin means that even the stain is gone. It was like I never did it. That, that's the only thing that can give me hope. How about y'all? That's the only thing that you can understand. The impossible became possible because you could never do enough to offset the one thing that you did that was wrong. What was the wrong thing? Being born. We were born in a sinful nature. And you didn't do that. The word of God says that we're born through that. He goes on, he says here, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. And this is crucial to you. There is no fear of God before their eyes. See, the Jews felt because they had a covenant. Brother Jack, they had a covenant with God. They didn't need to fear God. Just like the evangelicals, the born-again believers today, the genuine born-again, they think, well, because we have a covenant with God, I don't need to fear God. But I want you to know God is still God. He's always been God. And Jesus said, that's who you need to fear. You don't need to fear man. Because man can only kill the body. In other words, you need to have a reverential respect for God. For God's almighty has never changed. And his judgment on sin is still his judgment on sin. And the only way that there's no judgment on the people of God, of the covenant people of God, is if the righteousness of God is operating in them. And that's Jesus Christ. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Then he goes on to say, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So let me ask you, what is he saying? When it, what, he's clarifying what the law was really meant to do. See, the Jews took the law as their salvation, and it was never meant to be, the law was never meant to be salvation. It's meant to point to salvation. The law is never Meant, was never designed to be salvation. Jesus, huh? That's right. It was to keep you going in the right direction because the judgment under the law was total destruction. And the word of God says, you know, he said, even you might keep, and did the, and James even said it like this. He said, you can keep almost all the law. But if you break it in one little thing according to that, then you're guilty of it all. Right. So what Paul was saying, he says that law, Sister Vicky, was never meant for, to save you. It was meant to point to the need for salvation. Someone who was able to keep the whole law. And the thing that Jesus said foremost when he came in the, the message in Matthew, he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, every dot and every tittle. The impossible became possible for the Jew and for the Gentile. And that's what Paul is saying. And he says this, he says this, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law shows us sin 
and it also shows us the price of sin. For the word of God says the wages of sin are death. And you find that also in the epistle of Romans. It says, but now the righteousness of God, listen, without the law is manifested. How, how can that be? Who, who is that? Jesus. That's Jesus, right? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Who are they talking about, Brother John? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Because it points to him. He fulfilled the law for us. That's justification. He paid the price. He shed his blood. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now listen, it's important to get these words. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, by faith of Jesus Christ, not in Jesus Christ, by faith of Jesus Christ, Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a perpetuation, that's a fancy word for atonement, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, the goodness of God, the long suffering of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Let me say that again. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. To declare his righteousness. That's not an adjective there, that's a noun. It's declaring a person. He's not saying that Jesus was righteous. He's saying Jesus is my righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. James 1.22 Not only those who are the hearer, but the doer of the law. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now I want you to understand something. We're justified by faith because of our faith of Christ Jesus, what he did. Without the deeds of the law does not remit nor negate the byproduct of living for Jesus. In other words, again, we have our text, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. What does the Word of God say? We are saved by grace through faith and not by, not by works, lest we boast. And what does he say? We are what? He is what? Workmanship. So we're the byproduct of that righteousness. Again, when he's talking about the deeds of the law, you don't have to add the deeds of the law to make sure that Jesus didn't miss something. But because you are genuinely saved, the circumcision is no longer an outward law, but an inward work. You become circumcised of the heart. So therefore, the law in itself is not, does not and never was a savior, but the righteousness of God, whom is Jesus, is the savior, who enable us to have the righteousness of God in us, which is Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus in us. It says, therefore, we can prove that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Do you understand that? It does not say that we are not to live unto the word of God. What it says is, is the law did not save you, neither did Jesus need the law to save you because he fulfilled the law. But because he fulfilled the law, we should live unto him like what we read in 2 Corinthians 5.15. Is he the God of the Jews only? Anybody can answer me? Is he just the God of the Jews? No, he's our God. 
anybody who comes. And you not know he's the creator of all mankind. But he's the father of only those who come to him through faith of Christ Jesus. Who come to him who are redeemed through the blood. He becomes the father. Now he's not the father to every one of the world. Every human being in the world. No. No matter what anyone says. He's the God, the creator of human, of the human race. But the only way he becomes a father is through the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And we couldn't do it. It was impossible, right? The impossible became possible. And that possible is Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, he is he, the God of Jews only, is he not only of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which just shall justify the circumcision by faith. Now look what he's saying. It is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith. Who's he talking about? The Jew. And uncircumcision through faith. But it's still faith. In Do we then make void? The law through faith? What's the answer? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. We establish the law. Yea, we establish the law. Brothers and sisters, our text in this, and we'll start on this next Wednesday on verse 12. I think I covered what you needed to understand in verses 1 through 12. It should be self-explanatory. But our text is what I'm going to read, and I'm going to give you our theme so that you'll understand. Word of God says our text in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Remember what we just read? How do we establish the law? Word of God says we establish it. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. How? Through what? Come on, God. How do we establish the law? Through faith. And he goes on to say here, For well, by grace are you saved how? Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now I'm going to read the Amplified and then we're going to read the theme. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Through your faith and this salvation, is not of yourselves for your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory unto himself. For we are God's own handiwork his workmanship, recreated, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God had predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and He ready for us to live. Hallelujah. Yes, and amen. Our theme is this. Be aware of the path of least resistance. Be aware of the path of least resistance. It is a slippery slope. Beware of the path of least resistance. It is a slippery slope. The impossible became possible. My brothers and sisters. And that's what Paul was saying. All the good things anybody ever did, all the covenant promises everybody had, God's covenant promise is sure and He's faithful even when we don't keep it. But what that means is not, He's not saying that when we sin that He's going to be faithful and bless us anyway. No, what He's saying is 
if you don't do what he wants, what he says, and what he has ordained you to do, then somebody else will. It will get done. It will get done. And that's what I'm saying to each and every one of you. You and I are important to God. Every joint supply. Everyone that doesn't really put a value on the work of God will always try to do better and better and better instead of let God have more and more and more. You can't do better until you give Him more. To He who's been given much, much is required. And as John the Baptist well said, He said, I must decrease in order for Him to increase. Now this is the key to it all as we close tonight. You can't do anything to add to your salvation if you're genuinely saved. But because you are genuinely saved, there's nothing you can't do if you surrender to Him. And that's what He's going to judge us on. Is what we should have, could have done. Not outside of what He's provided, but because He has provided. This is our confidence that what he has started in us, he is faithful to complete what he started. Father God, I thank you for your word tonight, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that as, as Paul laid out step by step, he removed every argument that everyone has, whether it be people of the Old Testament or as I'm sharing today, I'm speaking more to the church today. I hear the same arguments in the church today that Paul listened to that he was trying to get them to understand the truth of God. To make the covenant, whether it be of the law or the spirit of the law, your God instead of your God, you will never ever be able to walk with him. Can two walk together lest to be agreed with God says. So Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, that we rightfully divide this truth, the word of truth. And that, Lord God, we keep pressing in toward the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. would you give God all the glory? Amen. Amen.